Beach Night is a one-of-a-kind, biannual campus tradition established in 1971, making it the longest running event of its kind in the country. You get a means of connection between people or places in particular. Public speaking is power. You say things in different ways, it means things, and it means different things to different people. But for us to be able to alleviate someone's misfortune, we have to first be able to listen to their problem. Acquiring the skill of speaking before a group of people may be one of the most important. Oh, there's a word to describe that feeling. According to the Walt Disney Company, they currently operate from infinity to beyond. There just comes a time when you have to stand up for your rights, and you have to stand up for what you believe, and you have to stand up for what's right. And at the time, I just kept thinking, I was like, you got up here, and you did what no one else could do. You got up here, you did what so many people were afraid to do. I was like, stop listening, because you're already a winner. First, would you send someone to prison to make yourself feel better? I probably would say no. It was quite an event. I was not prepared to win, did not expect to win. It was, it was a surprise and a good one. What you need to do is find a way to channel that nervousness into what you're doing, into your speaking, into your presentation. And I tried to remember that, and I guess it worked that night. I mean, I was one of maybe seven people who were, you know, honored to give a speech at this amazing event in front of so many people, but it, that, it's a lot of responsibility and it's a lot of stress. To bring this all to them, to make them feel like they're really a part of it. Thinking, what are you going to say to them? I'm Alyssa Taylor. Welcome to the IUPUI Communication Speech Contest. Um, I'm the Assistant Lab Director and the Assistant Director of tonight's event. Before we get started, I want to go ahead and take a moment to introduce your MC for tonight, Katia Halstead. Katia is a 100th Speech Contest winner. In addition, she's our graphic designer at the Speakers Lab, designed all of the graphics for tonight's event. So let's give her a round of applause and welcome your MC for tonight, Katia Halstead. Hello, I'm Katia and I was honored to be chosen as the winner of the 100th speech competition. I'm also honored to be your MC for tonight's event 
the final speech competition as IUPUI. Starting next fall, this competition will be hosted by IU Indianapolis. So let's make the most of this special event. We have some amazing speakers tonight competing for a winning title and scholarship and some wonderful entertainment throughout the evening. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Christine Karnick, the head of the Department of Communication Studies. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you, our public speaking scholars, friends, parents, colleagues, and guests to the 106th semi-annual speech night in this, our amazing venue, the Madam Walker Theater. The Department of Communication Studies has held this event continually at the end of each fall and spring semester since 1971. It is, in fact, the longest continuously running event on campus. Over those years, we have heard wonderful and thoughtful speeches on a wide variety of topics at the forefront of social discourse. Tonight promises to be more of the same, an evening of great oratory in an amazing and historic theater. You know, ever since I learned that this building was going to align with IEPUI, I've been hoping that speech night would find its way here. And it did. And you may ask why. I want to tell you a little bit about it, about this place, this theater, which is part of the Madam C.J. Walker Legacy Center. It was built in 1927 completed some eight years after Madam Walker's death. Madam Walker was an amazing woman. She was the first female self-made millionaire in America. She achieved this by creating an African-American hair care and beauty products empire. If you want to learn more about this fascinating person, there are a number of books and a 2020 Netflix, Netflix film called Self Made, starring Octavia Spencer and Tiffany Haddish. And this theater, some of you who are in the back, I hope at some point you can come forward to see kind of the decoration that is around uh, near the front of this place. So many great talents, especially jazz musicians, have appeared here over the years. This theater is considered one of the few remaining African Art Deco buildings in the United States. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. I'm so very happy that we have this as our home for this event. Well, and as for the event, author and aviator Anne Morrow Lindbergh once wrote, good communication is as stimulating as black coffee and just as hard to sleep after. I hope and expect that at the end of this competition, you'll be able to experience that sentiment. You're about to hear seven of the best speeches created this fall. And to add to this excitement, you get to participate in the evaluation process. A great deal rides on the decisions that you will make as you listen to these speakers. The winner of tonight's competition takes home not only a lovely plaque, bragging rights, and a nice resume line, but also a $2,000 scholarship. So listen carefully and choose wisely. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank the people who have made this night possible. First, your instructors. Thank you. Thank you to all of our wonderful R110 instructors. Your efforts are truly and genuinely appreciated. Next, thank you to the R110 leadership team who keep this course running smoothly each year by coordinating roughly 140 classes and 4,000 students, and who have made this evening possible. Most importantly, our course director, Steve Overby. Thank you to our speakers lab mentors and technical crew who are here filming the event, 
and our wonderful event coordinator, Dr. Angela Sisson. Finally, our event MC and the winner of last year's speech night, Katya Halstead. And finally, I want to thank and commend you, scholars, R110 students, for making a valuable investment in your future by completing this course. Engaging in smart, clear, informed oral communication is a gift that you will use throughout your lives. The skills you've acquired will help you professionally and personally, regardless of your major. However, for those of you who have not yet committed to a major, might I suggest communication studies? A little biased. A communication studies degree can provide you with the knowledge and a set of skills that are critical to organizations and transferable between organizations and even careers. Don't believe me? Look at sought after majors and skills listed on Indeed and Career Builder. I guarantee you'll be surprised at how often you see communication. Another possibility you may want to consider, oh, there's a double major too. You can double major in one major and communication studies. Just a thought. Another possibility you may want to consider is a BA in applied theater, film, and television, which is taught out of communication studies as well. If you have an interest in either theater, film and television studies, or film, television, media, production, and studies, this degree will give you a great start in those fields. On the other hand, even if you've already chosen another major, you may want to consider one of our minors. We offer six, including organizational and corporate communication, media arts and production, health communication, persuasion, and even theater. If you look up soft skills that employers look for in, in potential employees on Indeed, here's what you'll see near the top of the list. Communication skills, quote, Good communication involves listening and observing as well as talking. Candidates must not only be articulate, they must be able to see beyond the spoken word and notice questionable behaviors and patterns. Employees with expert communication abilities can mitigate a problem before it becomes a crisis, fostering collaborative solutions when they're needed most. Monster.com echoes the sentiment, adding, if you can clearly express the who, what, when, where, why, and how of a project, you'll be a hot ticket. And their advice on how to gain that skill, they say, take public speaking. So congratulations to you. You've done just that. So don't throw away what you've learned this semester. Keep that material close by. Remember what a good introduction looks like what it should accomplish, remember how an oral argument should be structured, how to transition between points, and how to summarize for the listener so they know what to take away from your words. You've been provided a great framework through which to communicate your ideas when you leave here and leave the university. Use it. You'll be very glad you did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karnick. Now we will have Faith Odiet. She is a 2024 top 10 student and the 2024 commencement speaker. Faith is a Chancellor Scholar with the Honors College majoring in criminal justice with a minor in leadership and military science. Faith has been on the Dean's list every semester and will have completed her bachelor's degree in only two years. Faith is working towards her commission as a military intelligence officer in the United States Army and will be pursuing a master's in public affairs at IUPUI. Faith is a member of the University Dean Advisory Board, O'Neill School of Public Affairs Recruitment Ambassador, and the Capital Warrior ROTC Battalion Company Commander. The process for being selected as the student commencement speaker begins in February of their senior year by application, followed by interviews, and finally a speaking audition before the selection committee. Students, you too can aspire to use your skills to be your class's student commencement speaker. 
Now, let's welcome Faith. Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And I know all of you are dreamers and believers. Distinguished guests, esteemed staff and faculty, proud families, friends, and of course, the incredible graduating class of 2024. Good evening. I want to begin by expressing my profound gratitude for being selected as a student commencement speaker. I feel so honored to stand before an empowering, resilient, and persevering group of individuals who have overcome challenges, celebrated victories, and are set to embark on a journey of boundless possibilities. Fellow graduates, as you stand here today, I want you to take in the magnificence of this moment, the sleepless nights, the endless assignments, the difficult exams, the minor setbacks, and the triumphant moments. They've all contributed to the masterpiece that is your academic journey. I want you to remember and acknowledge how hard you've worked to make your future better by striving to be a positive member of the IUPUI community. And that makes you not just the stars of today, but the architects of tomorrow. And I know, the end of a journey may make one feel fear, doubt, and confusion. In this moment, we might be unsure of the twists and turns that await. But remember, our story is not defined by the challenges we face. It is defined by how we overcome them. You have the power to shape your future. We have the power to shape our destiny. And I know it, because I've been there. At the age of nine, my guiding star, my father, passed away leaving my mother the task of navigating life alone with four children. But my mother is a dreamer. She had hope and belief in creating a better future for my siblings and me. So she inspired us, she motivated us, and she encouraged us to be better. Fast forward to the age of 14. I left my home country, Nigeria, and everything I've known to move to the United States. A foreign land with hesitation looking around me but I navigated down the path of hope and belief of a better future that my mother has instilled in me. So I adapted and embraced my new world. The people, the language, the accent, the culture. Even though I'm still learning to adapt to the food, like burgers, chicken nuggets, mac and cheese. Really? <laughs> Despite moments of fear and confusion, I learned the power of resilience and determination. Through the power of dreaming and believing, I continued conquering every step of my journey, which is not just defined by my academic milestones, but by the triumph of the human spirit that turned pain into power and dreams into reality. Graduates, you represent IUPUI to the world an institution that has been more than just a home, but a canvas upon which you painted a picture of your potential. So make sure you do a good job of representing the strength, courage, and dedication of the IEPY community. After all, education is not just about books and grades. It's about the skills you develop and the characteristics you build. IEPY has been a wonderful place to do that with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion, great resources, supportive faculty and staff, unique experiences, leadership opportunities, and memorable events such as Jagapalooza, Jagathon, Regatta, or even a study abroad. As you step into the next chapter of your life, I want you to think about how you can contribute to the society as a member of the IEPY community. Use your education and skills to dream big and innovate to find solutions to the pressing problems of our time. A staff member at the O'Neill School, Stacy Lorza, said to me, the possibilities are endless. So you have the power to influence the change you want to see in the world. I want to leave you with the words of Eleanor Roosevelt echoing in your heart. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Let us take this word with us 
as we embark on this new chapter, knowing the possibilities are endless for those who dare to dream. Today, we become the agents of change, the trailblazers, and the leaders the world desperately needs. Congratulations, class of 2024. May your journey be filled with passion and purpose. I know we all have a dream. Don't be afraid to believe in it. Take actions towards achieving those dreams and never ever give up on your goals. The future now belongs to all of us as we believe in the beauty of our dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Now, before bringing out our first speaker to the stage, I want to take a moment to review the judging and voting process with each of you. You should have all received a paper tonight that includes the event agenda, the names of the contestants, and a section with a QR code for both the program and the live voting links. If you did not receive this paper, you can view it digitally at thespeakerslab.info. On the back of the agenda sheet, there is a place for you to score each contestant on a variety of categories, including the proper Monroe format, citations, and speech delivery. We ask that you score fairly and consistently. Make sure you are judging based on the same criteria for each contestant. After all seven contestants have given their speech, you will vote by ranking the contestants from first to seventh place. When it is time to vote, you will use your phone camera and scan the QR code. In that time, you will use the Google form and rank the contestants, one being the best. If you do not remember the order of the speakers, you can review the event agenda and see the contest order there. Once the scores are calculated and the time penalties are put into place, we will announce third place, second place, and our 106 speech competition winner. Now, Let's meet the 106 speech competition contestants. Our first speaker for the night is Sophia Taylor. She's from Shelbyville, Indiana, and is studying social work with the aspiration to inspire and uplift people. Sophia is most proud of being a part of her family and feels blessed to learn how to love the way they have loved her her whole life. Her greatest accomplishment is making her family proud and smile. Her instructor is Professor Cawthorn. Now, oh, and her speech title is the connection. Now let's welcome Sophia to the stage. Prisons do not disappear social problems. They disappear human beings. Unemployment, not having access to housing, illiteracy, mental illness, and drug addiction are only a few of the problems that disappear from the public view when the human beings contending to these issues are relegated to cages. One action, one choice, one decision. That's the only difference between where you're sitting now and where another human being is sitting at this very moment behind bars. How would you feel if the one moment in your life when you made a terrible decision, a choice that you're not proud of, a time in your life that you made a mistake, if that label was constantly being held over your head in your job occupation, when looking for housing, in family conversations. Many people today live in the incarceration system, live under this label, live under that one decision. So as I go through my speech, keep in mind that we are not our one mistake. And think about a time when you made a mistake to grow in compassion for those within the system. 
Today, I will be using multiple sources from different universities to federal organizations to prove data and to show you guys that we need a strong wave of social workers within the incarceration system. And we need better funding for those. And I hope to inspire you in how you guys can all help advocate for this need. According to sentence.org, the, incarceration, the incarceration rates in the United States have risen over 500% in the last 40 years. 500%. At this very moment, there are over two million people sitting behind bars. So that means that in the next, in the years to come, there will be two million people reintegrated back into society. The issues that come with that are tremendous. Most of the time, they have unemployment issues, issues with finding the food necessary to live a sustainable life. Their connections have dwindled and now there is a social stigma surrounding their very being. That is where social workers come in. There are many programs out there in the world to help find their resources, but the programs do no good to the individuals if those people do not know that the programs exist. That is why social workers are the connection point between the people and the programs that are needed to help them reintegrate into society successfully. The only problem is that there are only three to four social workers, according to the NASW national website, for per, per thousand incarcerated individuals. Three to four people helping 1,000 individuals. That is not nearly enough adequate energy and time to find the needs met for that one person. That isn't enough time to build a relationship. That isn't enough time for them to find a community to go back into society with after being alone in a system. So how do we fix this problem? With a system so large with over two million people, what solution could there be in order to help bring social work into prison systems? One possible solution is public-private partnerships. And there is a real-life example in which we all lived through, the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the National Bureau of Medicine, there was 304 million doses of the COVID vaccination handed out to people and successfully admitted during that time period. I talk about it not to focus on the vaccinations themselves, but to focus on the fact that when public partnerships intertwine with public ones, and they have one goal and one mission, the funds can happen. Change can occur when everybody is on the same page and in one mind and one accord. That same wave of change that happened in a few short years during the pandemic can also happen within the prison systems. All we need is a common goal on how to get there. And this change, is not good just for the individuals, but for the community as well. According to Washington Post, the money that is in can be allocated to public work projects, such as roads, better education, better, better health services, and other needs in the community. Alongside of community public work projects, individuals themselves then get to tap into their unique talents and abilities. Think about someone that you know that has been behind bars for so long. They live under that label. They live under that one choice. They then think that they are that one mistake. A social worker can then bring out the things that they are good at, help them tap into their unique born abilities. That way they can give, then give back to the community in a way that they never thought possible. Now, how can you all help? On the screen behind me, I have the numbers of Indiana state legislatures. You can call and contact them. You can advocate for this cause, raise awareness for this issue. You might be one person, but if all of us collectively together spread this message and then continue to tell more people, then the two million people within the prison system can then be reached. There's also a QR code behind me. If you get your phones out and scan it, there's a link that comes up for volunteering options. 
Take a moment and imagine if you were in their shoes, by yourself, taken away from the community that you lived in most of your life. It'd be a dark place. It'd be confusing. But if you volunteer to go into the prison system, you can then be a glimmer of light to people who have no hope. You can be the hope that sparks their interest to change, to be given an opportunity to do better. Today I have gone over the, rate, the rising incarceration rates that is occurring now. I have talked about a possible outcome of change that we can all help toward. And I hope I have inspired you to look more into this volunteering option. Thank you. Speaker two tonight is Michelle Motley. She grew up in Indianapolis and hopes to be accepted into the medical imaging program. Michelle is most proud of her ability to tackle both her jobs, volunteering at Riley, and being a full-time student. Her instructor is Professor Sheeler, and her speech title is Sexual Education Matters. Let's all welcome Michelle Motley. Hmm? Okay, just get my first slide. Oh Lord, I'm gonna kill myself. Good evening. Um, by the giggles and the reactions, I don't think I really have to explain what my title means. Um, but many people will think, isn't this topic overused? Me included, I didn't really know what to pick, but when I saw this topic, it really got me to think. I've heard this, this conversation with my peers, my teachers at school, and my doctor's office, but the statistics and the conversation never ends. So, if you really think about it, why hasn't anything changed? So, to start off, Office of Populations Affairs dedicated their time in 2020 and determined that 15% of females that were the age between 15 through 19 were categorized as teen mothers, not for their first, but for their second time. Now, for many, this may not matter, but for those that care, you may wonder, why does it matter? So, it doesn't, it doesn't admit to the fact that many diseases such as HIV, HPV, chlamydia, and gonorrhea are spreading amongst these teens at a rapid speed. And they're facing backlash from becoming teen parents at the young age without truly understanding the consequences that become. And they're living with the diseases without truly understanding the risk or even knowing that they have it. And the adolescents are being robbed of valuable information that they could have learned early on that could have protected them and kept them health and safe. Now, granted, being a teen parent isn't the end of the world, nor is having the disease. I'm not here to bash anybody if it has happened to that person. It's a joyous moment becoming a parent. However, if we had the adequate education system and the true conversation, we could prevent these kinds of incidents from occurring. Now, the first thing that many people hear when we have these kinds of conversations is abstinence. As a child that went to a Catholic school for the past eight years of her life, that's all I heard. Abstinence, abstinence, abstinence. We never truly had the conversation to talk about what could have happened had we had this conversation. Now, when I think of sex education, I think of the healthy road. We actually sit down and have the conversation about what could happen and what are the potential risks. And abstinence is just a fast food option. It's fast, it's easy, it's reliable, and it gets it out the way. But abstinence isn't truly the key. As I mentioned, I went to a Catholic school, so that's all that they were telling me. But it didn't truly give me the information about what was going on within my body and treating me how I needed to be taught. And it didn't tell me about the unwanted pregnancies or infections that I could have gotten later on in life. And Elizabeth Boski from Very Wealth Health concluded in 2019 that 57% of the 12th graders that she spoke to had already had sex. 20% of those freshmen had also already had sex, including 3% of those teens having sex before the age of 13. And she also concluded that 9% of those females had either had to be tested or had developed an STD. Now for many parents and guardians, this number should be alarming, as this is your child and you want the best for them and to be able to protect them. 
So a change obviously needs to come. Pregnancies have been on a decline, I will admit that. However, it doesn't account for the abortions and the sexually transmitted diseases that have inclined with these teenagers. Aisha Roscoe from w WYFI Indianapolis inter interviewed Jennifer Manlove, who's a child trans researcher, and they concluded that although teenager um, pregnancies have been on a decline, it doesn't account for the fact that the abortions have been in inclining and have passed women that are in their middle ages. And the decline shouldn't stop us from having these conversations because at any given point, the number could always increase. Now, for many people, there are consequences with their actions and being a parent, a teen parent has their amount of consequences. And according to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, around 50% of those teen mothers that become a mother during their high school only graduate by the age of 22. And the National Library of Medicine concluded that children that are birthed to teen parents are at risk of emotional, cognitive, and physical issues due to the inability of their parents truly being able to raise their children. And these young parents are also put at risk to emotional disorders such as depression, um, drug and alcohol disorders due to the lack of support that many of them receive from parents and their loved ones, not mentioning also the sexually transmitted diseases that they may receive. What's gonna happen if we continue to ignore this issue? Are the numbers of pregnancies gonna continue to increase? Will the number of infections continue to increase? And why are we still sitting here waiting for a change to truly happen? Now, granted, this situation isn't like magic and it's not gonna go away overnight. As a community, we all must come together to truly understand the issue at hand and fix it. These are the young people that are gonna be ruling the world when we're too old to do it ourselves. Now, where are students most of their time growing up? At school. Schools have the responsibility to tackle these kinds of conversations. It's important for them to build an area of communication and trust for these students to ask questions. After all, it is their body, and they should have the ability to not feel judged and be able to ask questions. Addressing these kinds of conversation gives them the ability to have confidence to make informed decisions about what's going on. Not to mention, Center for Disease Control and Protection expressed that having quality sex health curriculum in schools has proven to allow the children to know the risk and the amount of pregnancies can decrease. Now, Planned Parenthood, it's a very known thing. It's available in most states. Most doctor offices promote it. And it's known for being one of the organizations that's best known for promoting safe sex. Just mentioning it in t offices when you go to the doctor, having the conversation with your parent, or just in a teacher setting, allows for the key communication to talk about promoting the safe sex to promote, to avoid the STDs and unwanted pregnancies. The resources can allow the adolescents to live their life healthy and safe. Now, as the role as a parent, when the kids aren't at home or out, they're with their, with their parent. As a parent, their role is to build a, chi a child-parent relationship, and it's built on trust. Having this kind of relationship, you can have the confidence to speak to your parent about what's going on within your body. And it may feel uncomfortable at first. I've had the conversation a couple times with the people around me. But after all, you're going to learn more about yourself, and you're going to be able to understand what's going on. And it leads the adolescents to feeling protected, not by just themselves, but the people around them to be able to talk to them. So going into the future, as a community, we genuinely need to speak to these young adolescents to be able to let them know what's going on within themselves. If we don't give them any information, the risk of infections and pregnancies will just continue to go up. And that just leaves for negativity within their lives. And also, sex education is a powerful tool that even adolescents deserve access to. So I leave with this. When is the breaking point for the bubbling issue to find its breaking point to finally fizzle out? Thank you. Oh, God, I want to go home. Our third speaker for the night is Natalie Tysinger. Natalie grew up in Savannah, Georgia, 
She enjoys watching crew, crew crime shows and movies, and after graduation, she aspires to be a forensic chemist and analyzing illicit drugs. Her biggest accomplishment so far was her acceptance to the IUPUI Honors College. Natalie's professor is Dr. Sisson, and her speech title is Abolition of Cash Bail. Everyone, let's welcome Natalie to the stage. According to the American Progress website, courts regularly assign cash bail as a condition of pretrial release based on the belief that paying bail is necessary to ensure appearance in court and protect public safety. But evidence has shown that this belief is unfounded. Now, how many of you all in here know how the cash bail system in the United States works? <laughs> so for those that don't know, when a person is arrested, bail is set by the court. Bail is an amount of money that the, must be paid in order for the defendant to be released from jail before their trial date, according to the Woods Bail Bond website. Now, not everyone is assigned bail. People who are arrested for more violent crimes are automatically set to stay in jail until their trial date. However, people arrested for nonviolent crimes are given bail. Now, you're probably wondering, why is this an issue to me? At some point in your life, you're probably gonna know someone who has either been in jail or is in jail, and whether or not they can afford the cash bail amount can have a huge impact. Now, I'm a forensic science major here at IEPY, which means that when I graduate, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time in court. So it's very important for me to understand our judicial system and how it works. And this is an issue that I'm very passionate about. So today, I'm gonna to help you understand why the cash bail system is harmful and needs to be stopped, and what benefits will come when it's gone. Now, lots of people are affected by cash bail, more than we know. So let's dive into that a little bit. According to the Vera Institute, roughly half of the people in the United States struggle to afford a $400 emergency expense. Yet, the average bail set on a felony case is $10,000. I personally know that I would not be able to pay $10,000 right now if it was required of me, and I think that most of the people in this room would feel the same way. Now, because of this, according to the Bail Project, across the nation, seven million people are sent to jail each year. Of those in jail on any given day, more than 60% are there because they cannot afford the cash bail amount required for their release. 60%, that's over half of the people in jail simply because they can't afford to get out. Now the graphic up on the screen shows the percentage of people in jail pre-trial versus the percentage of people total. And as you can see, in 2018, it hit 65%. 65% of those people weren't even convicted of their crime yet yet they were still in jail. So, because of this, some states have gotten rid of it. Now, according to the World Population Review website, there are currently five states that do not have a cash bail system. Those states are Illinois, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, and Washington, D.C. And California has a modified cash bail system. So they do assign cash bail on occasion, but regularly they do not. Now, a primary reason many states who have made changes to their cash bail system have cited as why they have done so is because of the clogging up of their jails. Across our nation, state and federal systems are struggling to find space for all the incoming individuals being incarcerated, according to the RED website. So what can we do to fix it? We need to abolish the Indiana state law that allows judges to assign cash bail. Now, current Indiana law states that if the court determines an arrestee is to be held subject to money bail, the court is authorized to determine the amount of such bail and whether such bail may be satisfied by surety bond and or cash deposit. 
we need to abolish this law and replace it with a new law that would allow people who are not of risk to themselves or others to be released from jail until their trial date without having to pay bail. Now, there's one more thing I wanna talk about, and that's the benefits. And there are three main benefits that I wanna talk with you about today. The first one is that people will get their families back. When you're waiting for a trial date, it is a hard and difficult time, a time that you wanna spend with your loved ones and get all the support you can. Some people are sitting in jail for up to a year waiting for their trial date. That is a long time to be away from your family in such a difficult time. If we stop cash bail, these people will be able to go home and spend time with their families before their trial date. Now, the second reason is one that I think some more politicians would like, and that's that it's gonna boost the economy. When all of these people are no longer in jail waiting for trial, they'll be going back out into the population. They'll be doing things such as buying things, possibly selling things, working, all of which is gonna help boost our economy. Now, the third benefit is that the jails will save money. If the jails have less people in there, they don't have to pay as much on their electricity bill, their water bill, and they don't have to pay for as many jailers to keep up with all the inmates. Now, probably wondering, what can we actually do? Well, I know that every single person in here has a cell phone, and I want you to take it out, and I want you to scan this QR code. It will take you to a petition. Once this petition gets 5,000 signatures, it will get emailed to the Indiana state legislators until they make a change. And I urge you not only sign it, but send it to your family, send it to your friends, post it on social media, because we need to convince the lawmakers that this has to change. And the other thing up on the board is emails of the state legislators for the general Indianapolis area. I urge you to email them, make your voice heard, and make them listen to us, because we need to abolish the cash bail system, because it is harmful, and it is unjust, and it is unfair. So please, help me get these people out of jail, and help me get them home. Help me get them back to their families. Thank you. How do I do one time? Speaker for tonight is Allie Byrne. She is from Crown Point, Indiana. She enjoys reading, and some of her favorite genres are romance and fiction. In the future, she hopes to open an animal sanctuary. Her instructor is Professor Sheeler. Her speech title is Detrimental Effects of Mental Health Stigma. Let's all welcome Allie Byrne. Approximately nine out of 10 people with mental health problems report experience of stigma. That means 90% of people who face mental anguish also have to cope with being ridiculed and judged for their uncontrollable conditions on top of trying to deal with their problems in a healthy manner. Many college students suffer from mental illness. Anyone could be a part of that 90% of people if nothing is done to prevent hate and judgment. I have witnessed friends and family members being ostracized, judged, and called crazy for their mental health issues ever since I was a child. They have suffered more because of these stigmas. They have experienced regression because of these stigmas. Mental health illnesses worldwide need to be accepted and destigmatized in order for everyone to be able to <sighs> to obtain the help and support that they need. People across the world are treating people with mental illnesses too harshly. They instead need to step up by uplifting and accepting people experiencing mental illnesses so they have an equal chance to thrive. Many people who suffer from mental illnesses are viewed as though they have a disease that is catchable. They are ostracized because they have a sickness that no one can see, while those suffering physically are coddled and empathized with. The article, A Qualitative Study, Experiences of Stigma by People with Mental Health Problems by Charlotte Huggett, published in 2018, states, 
If you got cancer, sympathy. Any kind of physical illness, you will get sympathy. But mental illness, you won't get sympathy. This insight is directly from a subject participating in a study about how people with mental illnesses are defected by stigma. The subject is saying that they have faced ridicule because their illness is mental instead of physical. This judgment does not allow for a person to feel safe to search for help because they are likely to be ostracized for their illness instead of empathized with. Another subject from this study said that you can't ring an ambulance. They're under stress anyway. There are only four emergencies. You've got to work out if your crisis is an emergency or not. So if you ring an ambulance and then you feel guilty because you've took an ambulance from somebody else. This subject was talking about when they were having suicidal thoughts. The stigma against mental health is so detrimental that people are considering ending their lives and not seeking help because they fear that their problems are not as important as a person with a physical injury. The stigma against mental health could potentially lead to many deaths because individuals feel that they do not deserve the same treatment as others who face physical illnesses. These stigmas also cause people who need help from mental health treatments, such as medications or even mental health facilities, to be much less likely to access the help that they need. The article, Mental Health Illness Stigma, Concepts, Consequences, and Initiatives to Reduce Stigma by Nicholas Roosh, published in 2020, states, many persons who are likely to benefit from that kind of treatment either choose to never start treatment or opt to end it prematurely. The greatest single cue that produces public stigma is this label. This label usually stems from participating in psychiatric services. Potential consumers may opt out may opt not to access care as a way to avoid this label. The stigma against people who suffer from mental illnesses is so impactful that people are refusing to go through potentially life-saving treatments. Thus, something needs to be done in order to reduce the stigma and allow everyone to obtain the help that they need. In order to address this, more opportunities need to be created to discuss the adverse effects of mental health stigma and normalization of mental illness. One way to do this is to have the public destigmatize getting help for mental health illnesses. One way to accomplish this is through public education. In the article, Mental Illness Stigma, Concepts, Consequences, and Initiatives to Reduce Stigma by Nicholas Roosh, it is shown that the National Alliance of, of the Mentally Ill, a group of family members and persons with mental illnesses, have been educating the public in order to diminish stigmatizing conditions, such as by pressing for le better legal protection, protection for persons with mental illness in the areas of housing and work. Although this is not specifically about helping people obtain help, this shows how impactful education can truly be. Being able to educate people about a certain subject with supporting factual evidence will allow the general public to begin to lose their fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown is what truly causes the most harmful stigmas because people tend to attack what they do not understand. Being able to educate people about mental illnesses will help to reduce the fear because they will start to understand the everyday, of lives, everyday lives of people with mental illnesses. This can also be seen in the article, Evidence for Effective Interventions to Reduce Mental Health Related Stigma and Discrimination by Professor Grant Thorncroft when it states that mental health education or informational interventions seem to be the most effective type of intervention with regards to outcomes at four or more weeks follow-up. Stigma can also be reduced from a young age. Creating different programs similar to the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program, but for mental illness awareness, will allow people to learn about mental illnesses from a young age. This will reduce fear among many adults because people will learn about mental illnesses when they are children. Children are typically more curious and have a lot less fear than adults do, so being able to create acceptance within their generation will be easier if they learn from a young age. This can be seen in the article, Crazy So What? A School Program to Promote Mental Health and Reduce Stigma, results of a pilot study by Ines Conrad when it states, at baseline, only 5.2% of the intervention group would talk to their teacher about a mental health problem. Immediately after the program, this number increased to 10.6% and after three months to 17.9%. Now, how exactly would people worldwide be affected by these changes? What would happen if nothing was done? 
There are two possible contrasting futures depending on if this matter is changed or if it, if it is left how it is right now. According to the World Health Organization's article called Mental Disorders, in 2019, one in every eight people or 970 million people around the world were living with a mental disorder. Imagine a world where nothing is done to help protect, to help people who admittedly are already suffering. They would be suffering tenfold because of purely unnecessary judgment and hate, meaning 970 million people are already at a higher risk for drastic measures to rid themselves of their pain, such as suicide. They don't need anything else to add on to it. As stated before, many people who face stigma are greatly affected by it negatively, and their own personal pain is typically already enough to have them on the brink. The additional pain and suffering stigma causes may be enough to send them over the edge. This is only how the occasional person is affected right now. If nothing were currently being done to reduce stigma, it would become very likely that over half of these 970 million people worldwide would resort to drastic measures to relie relieve themselves of their pain and suffering. The mind can only take so much. In contrast, in a world that empathizes with and supports those with mental illnesses would allow for everyone to thrive. These 970 million individuals would be able to get the help that they need in order to lead the best lives possible. Instead of resorting to harmful actions, they'd be able to learn healthy ways to live with their illnesses. Even better, they'd be able to get to a point where they wouldn't fear being judged for something that they can't control. It obviously wouldn't be an immediate positive difference, but through teaching children acceptance and empathy for those with mental illness, future generations wouldn't have to fear being stigmatized. Just imagine a world where people can live their lives and get help whenever they need it without being ostracized. This will only happen if we work towards accepting all individuals for who they are. Right now, there are many organizations and efforts someone could consider to further this movement. They can go to the National Alliance on Mental Illness website and educate themselves on the truth about mental illness. There are also many different advocacy pro projects fighting for equality and destigmatization that they could join. There are even many mental health student organizations here at IUPUI, such as Active Minds, to create more awareness and acceptance towards mental health. So, I implore everyone to do something, even if it seems insignificant right now, to create more help and acceptance for all individuals around the world. Our fifth speaker tonight is Molly Bates. Molly grew up in Speedway, Indiana. Her proudest accomplishment thus far is her participation in the Indianapolis Zoo's Zoo Teen Program as a camp counselor. Her career goal is to work at the zoo. Her professor is Professor Cummings, and her speech title is The Price We Pay. Let's welcome Molly to the stage. Hello, everyone. I would like to start tonight's speech off with a poll, just a raise of hands. How many of you in this room are currently wearing makeup? Yes, myself included. How many of you go to the gym to work out? OK, and one last question, and you don't have to answer this, but how many of you do that because you want to? Many people feel that they don't live up to society's expectations of how they should look, and they take great lengths to remedy this. Some people spend their whole lives chasing this idea of beauty, that they lose themselves in it. In her 2006 book, Beauty Junkies, Alex Kononsky tells us that Americans spend $15 billion on plastic surgery every year, and that number has only gone up. Personally, I have struggled with my own body positivity, mostly in middle school and high school, but I don't think I'm completely in the clear yet either. If this is something we don't get a handle on right now, we could struggle with it for the rest of our lives. So my key takeaway for you tonight 
is that you should focus on being comfortable in your own body rather than living up to societal expectations of what you should look like. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this problem. In a 2018 study done by Puyong University on why fifth and sixth grade elementary schoolers were wearing makeup, it was found that girls who had a lower self-esteem wore makeup to mask their negative emotions and mask things that they didn't like about themselves. Whereas girls with a higher self-esteem wore makeup to elevate things they liked about themselves, and they wore it for fun. Furthermore, I think we've all heard about this new miracle drug on the market called Ozempic. Now, in case you don't know what that is, basically, it's a diabetic drug that was originally made for diabetic people, but it's currently being used as mostly a weight loss drug. But there is a very big price. It makes you nauseous, sick, all the time. And I think anybody who's ever experienced the feeling of nausea can tell you that that is one of the worst feelings in the world. We as a society should not be glorifying this basic form of self-harm to attain something as fragile and subjective as beauty. Furthermore, it would be ignorant to pretend that men don't also struggle with this problem, even though normally when we talk about body positivity, it is mainly directed towards females. In Edson Dawson's book, Behold the Man, he talks about the effect of seeing pictures like this, of perfect, sexy men, in magazines and on the internet. Before he was seeing these pictures, he felt actually pretty comfortable with his body. But once he started seeing these images, he started feeling inadequate. So he started going to the gym and working out and doing all these things. But one day, he began to realize that he wasn't doing this for his own benefit. He was rather doing it to be more attractive to other people. Again, if you look back at my PowerPoint image, I think that we all know that this image is pretty impossible to obtain without the use of something like steroids or other performance-enhancing drugs. But this is also, at the same time, what you're expected to look like. So what can we do about this problem? Well, first of all, education. In a 2018 study done called Promoting Body, Positive Body Image, it was shown that just by talking about body positivity in elementary schools increases body positivity later in life, making people feel more comfortable in their own bodies. Furthermore, we need to not villainize any of these things. Working out, makeup, and even plastic surgery are definitely not bad things. They only become detrimental when we do them for other people rather than for ourselves. Furthermore, a lot of people feel forced to partake in things such as makeup or even shaving your legs or something like that. So that's why we should also not villainize these things. Furthermore, plastic surgery, as much as we like to vilify it, can be a very important part of healing from trauma, from something that you might have been bullied about for a very long time, or even just a feature that you would like to see on yourself. Again, you should do it for yourself, not for other people. So what will the world be like when we solve this problem of doing it for ourselves, not for other people? Well, rates of eating disorders such as bulimia and anorexia will hopefully go down because people aren't going to feel the need to hurt themselves to obtain beauty. Furthermore, people will be happier. In a 2013 study done called Is Beauty the Price of Happiness, it was shown that people who felt more attractive often acted nicer and were more generous. And I think that's no duh. Anyone who's ever felt bad knows that you don't really want to be nice to other people. It's hard when you feel bad about yourself. People aren't going to be lashing out.
So in conclusion, we will benefit more by partaking in society's beauty's expectations to the extent that we want to, rather than for others. Makeup, working out, and even plastic surgery are not bad, and you, should, you deserve to value yourself for who you are, not for who you could be. And my speech today might not convince you to love your body, but I hope it made you feel a little more comfortable in it. Thank you. Our sixth speaker of the evening is Maggie Hopple. Maggie is from Noblesville, Indiana, and is majoring in creative writing and journalism. With this, she enjoys telling stories, both true and fictional. In the future, she would like to visit another country or write a novel, but above all, she'd like to be remembered as a good human. Her professor is Dorado Marisco. Her speech title is Original Sin. Let's all welcome Maggie to the stage. Picture the person who knows you best, and I'll tell you why you're wrong. Do you spend an average of seven hours a day with that person? Do they know your search history? Do they follow you into the bathroom and sit with you on the toilet? Of course not, but your phone does. Because in the modern era, people don't know us best. Our devices do. And it makes us easy to manipulate through what the tech company Meta has labeled personalized ads. These ads are predatory on the psychological level and demand tighter regulation. Today, I'm going to show you the range of influence these ads have, the tactics they use, and what we can do to protect ourselves and our loved ones. So how do these ads work? Personalized ads combine online behavioral targeting with psychological targeting to create a message so tailored to the individual that it can shape their future behavior. They start by considering your past behavior online through a network of web trackers. Somewhere on the internet, there's a record of everything you've ever clicked on and how long you've stayed there. This helps determine your interests, what captures your attention, and what makes you angry or afraid. These factors act as building blocks for your psychographic profile. Your psychographic profile helps advertisers determine what they perceive to be your vulnerabilities, socioeconomic status, mental health, even interpersonal relationships that they can then exploit to create a desperation for their product. With that in mind, I'd like you guys to meet my mom. Her name is Emily. She gave me permission to share some photos of her today. Just a few. Like many middle-aged women, my mom struggles with the laugh lines and sunspots on her face. And she gets upset when she buys cute clothes and feels too old to wear them. This makes my mom a prime target for ads that portray aging as an inadequacy that she needs to correct. Through this serum, that concealer, even cosmetic surgery. But any billboard can do that. Personalized ads can pinpoint the exact times my mom is most likely to feel insecure about herself from when she gets ready in the morning to specific days in her menstrual cycle and saturate her screen with those types of ads right then. Because to tech and advertising companies, my mom is just another click onto their add to cart button. And we could do this with anything. We could exploit anything about her 
from her job as a public school teacher, to her status as a cancer survivor, to her past struggle with depression, and even her love for her family. Every time my mom opens her iPhone, it picks her apart like an animal on a dissection table in order to weaponize her every idiosyncrasy in the ads she sees. So what does Meta have to say about their personalized ads? In 2022, the company released a commercial with bright colors and fun music, arguing that their personalized ads help support small businesses by linking advertisers to good fit customers, thus helping good ideas get found. But what other advertisers are they supporting? The 2018 Cambridge Analytica scandal suggests that politicians can buy our votes using these same social media algorithms. Show of hands, how many of you have taken an online personality quiz before? Working through Facebook, the political consulting firm Cambridge Analytica used this tool to harvest over 5,000 data points on over 87 million individual Facebook profiles, starting with the quiz takers themselves and then working outward to their friends and family through the posts they liked. Cambridge Analytica then used this information to create micro-targeted political messages with the goal of shifting voter behavior in the 2016 presidential election. Regardless of whom you choose to vote for, what's important is that that decision is made by you, not politicians and not tech companies, arguing that their predatory advertising techniques are about anything less than selling your human experience to the highest bidder. Is there anything we can do to change this? As long as predatory advertising is benefiting the people in office and the companies running their campaigns, it's unlikely that we'll see any change from our lawmakers anytime soon. As a result, it's up to us to minimize the effects of personalized advertising in our own lives. We can start by monitoring our privacy settings. Do you know how to block personalized ads on an iPhone? Because this image I found after one Google search. We can also adjust our ad preferences on social media. On Meta Apps, there's a feature that allows you to tell the app what types of ads you'd like to see rather than letting the algorithm decide for you. You can also consider downloading an ad blocker, like this one for your phone, to limit the quantity of ads on your screen. As digital natives, it's also our responsibility to educate our loved ones about online privacy risks. Sure, sometimes funny things happen when older people don't know how to use Facebook, but the reality is that it costs them their personal information and makes them among the most susceptible to predatory advertising techniques. Right now, tech and advertising companies have the upper hand because of our lack of awareness. The more we educate each other about the dangers of personalized ads, the more accountability we can create. Ethan Zuckerman invented the pop-up ad. 14 years later, he said this. Advertising is the original sin of the web. We can't learn, create, or communicate online without chaining ourselves to the influence of personalized ads. By holding tech and advertising companies like Meta accountable for the original sin of predatory advertising, we bring our digital communities a little bit closer to the gardens of free thinking they were always meant to be. Thank you all for your time.
Last but not least is Maitali Upadhyay. She has grown up in many places across India. One of the accomplishments she is most proud of is being able to obtain a second degree in the Indian classical dance of Kathak. The goal Maitali has is to explore the potential of various healthcare measures that can improve the current standards. Her instructor is Professor Plow. Her title is Beyond the Pills, Nature's Own Promise. Let's all welcome Maitali. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to have you all here with me tonight. Before we begin, oh, OK. Technical glitch, can't help it. Before I begin with my discussion, I have a quick question for all of you. Raise your hands and tell me, how many of you reach out for an Advil or a Tylenol to cure your headache without a second thought? Come on, let's be honest. That's quite a lot of us. And thank you for your response. That's a lot of us. It's common, isn't it? But let me tell you that this comfort from a medicine that seems harm harmless can be really harmful to us and might even lead to fatality. I'm not trying to scare you, but now I'm going to tell you about an alternative approach. This is an ancient 5,000-year-old approach, originally from India, which is a natural approach that can not only cure your headache, but also harmonize your body's balance. We call this the world of Ayurveda, nature's own promise to health and wellness. In the contemporary world, we're reaching for a medicine has become our default response. Little do we know that this comfort comes at a cost. Talking about the recent publication by Wolf et al., which said that the overuse of these common pain relief medicines has been causing severe health conditions with a lot of population, which includes 10,000 hospitalization cases annually in the United States alone. Furthermore, there's another cause, which is antibiotic resistance. This is another dangerous thing that has become a global threat. CDC, the Center for Drug Protection and Control, recently cited that antibiotic resistance is causing a lot of global threat, which caused 35,000 deaths annually in the United States alone. Talking about antibiotic resistance, it's a phenomena where, as you can see in the picture, the bacteria no more reacts to the drugs, which was initially designed to kill them, because now they're immune to it. Well, what do we do about it? Welcome to the world of Ayurveda. As I said, Ayurveda is an ancient Indian tradition on a medical approach which has been studied and practiced since past 5,000 years. Ayurvedic approach involves natural therapies and treatments using herbs and only natural ingredients. Unlike allopathy, the chemical treatment, which involves various medicines and other chemical treatments, and only focuses on symptom management. But Ayurveda, it looks at the root cause of the disease and tends to eliminate, so that the disease is less likely to occur the next time. Let's talk, about diabetic, let's talk about the Ayurvedic approach to chronic disorders like diabetes. As you can see here, the Ayurveda uses natural ingredients of ginger water, bitter gourd, and moong dal to cure diabetes, unlike allopathy, which uses insulin and other medicines. In a recent report by Gupta, it was proven that patients who adopted Ayurveda as a, as a cure tend to not only have a reduction in their blood sugar levels, but also had an improvement in their health, with a reduction in their dependency on the chemical drugs. Talking about how people say that precaution is always better than cure, Ayurveda does this, again, using natural ingredients. In Ayurveda, there's one specific mention of Dinacharya, or the Ayurvedic clock daily routine, which involves morning rituals to detoxify your body, various yoga and meditation poses to support your mental health, and other dietary supplements to help you boost your immunity and aid in your digestion. Now, this again reminds me of another article, which was published by Singh in 2020, which said that 
individuals who adopt Ayurveda as a precautionary measure are not only less likely to, adopt, to get any chronic disorders, but they also reduce a lot of chemical burden. Now let's visualize the world of Ayurveda. Imagine, instead of waking up tired because of the sleeping pill which you took the previous night, you wake up refreshed and energized. Thanks to the Ayurvedic practice that not only reset your body's cardiac rhythms, but it also gave you an amazing sleep. Let's also talk about a world, a healthcare system, where doctors no more prescribe you with antibiotic medicines for minor infections but rather they prescribe you with immune boosting prevention and treatments. Now these treatments not only prevent you from illnesses, but also they reduce the antibiotic resistance on the global, which has become a major global threat these days. Now, a major persuasive argument about this comes from a World Health Organization report. According to the report, it is said that Inculcating these complementary and traditional approaches to our primary healthcare can help us prevent the illnesses and reduce the cost of healthcare in most of the countries. We all know how expensive the healthcare is, and without a health insurance, you cannot afford the healthcare. As we all know, talk, going back to this topic, I would like to say that let's adopt Ayurveda and make our life better. Now, Let's take another major picture view. Let's think about the environment. Lesser the pharmaceutical companies, lesser will be the pharmaceutical waste, and lesser will be the chemical burden on our soil and water. This way, we're not only benefiting our bodies and our health, but we're also giving a benefit to our environment and our planet. We are thus encouraging ourselves to live a healthier and happier life in this green ecosystem. Let's move ahead. Now, since we know that this scenario is achievable only if we take the right steps, so let's take the first step towards Ayurveda. Now, I'm not going to ask you guys to go overhaul and organic overnight. That's not possible. Let's begin with a small step. Let's talk about turmeric latte. In Ayurvedic language, we also refer to it as golden milk. Because of turmeric, the primary ingredient in the latte, which is said to have both antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Now, this turmeric has four major benefits. Number one, it helps you regulate your sleep. Number two, it boosts your immunity. Number three, it aids in digestion. And number four is something which you all might be at some point in your life be very interested in. It is that it supports longevity and graceful aging. <laughs> Okay, so now how to prepare a turmeric latte? It's a very simple two-step process. Number one, take one cup of milk, heat it and bring it to a boil. Step number two, add one teaspoon of turmeric to it, mix it and you have your own golden milk ready. Are you guys excited to try this? Yeah. Come on, yay! <laughs> okay, so now I invite each of you to take this first step with me. Try replacing one part of your daily lifestyle with an Ayurvedic practice. So maybe as you guys were excited about, call off your day with a turmeric latte. And trust me, you'll wake up refreshed and energized in the next morning. You can also try another approach by waking up five minutes early in the morning. And instead of making a morning espresso shot, you can do some yoga and meditation poses. Try this for one week and trust me, you will see the change. Now to help you guys further, I have attached a QR code here. You all are free to scan this. This will take you to my Linktree page, where I have attached various links from YouTube and other Amazon sites, which, which are various product description and links, which will help you take the first necessary step towards Ayurveda. All right. Coming towards the end of our speech tonight, I would like to conclude saying that switching to Ayurveda is not about rejecting the modern day medicines. Instead, it is about adopting a lifestyle which complements our care along with a boost to our energy. So now, I want us all to end this together with a drill where I will say beyond the pills and all of you have to encourage saying nature's own promise. I hope you're all ready for this, so let's do this. Beyond the pills. Beyond the pills. One last time and louder this time. Beyond the pills.
Thank you so much for being an amazing audience for me tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Let me come again. Thank you for being an amazing audience for me tonight. But you guys can thank yourselves later once you adopt Ayurveda in your daily lives. I have adopted Ayurveda and trust me, I get an amazing sleep. So I hope you guys do that too. And I would like to end it with Sadhanyavad. Do not forget to try the turmeric latte tonight. What a great round of speakers we had. Let's give them all another round of applause. As we begin the voting portion of our speech contest tonight, we remind you to rank all contestants one through seven and use the QR code that is in your event agenda and on screen. While the votes continue to come in, we tally them up. Please give your attention to Myra Kivett for this evening's entertainment. Hello, good evening. My name is Myra, and I am currently an Applied Communication Master's student here at IUPUI. Um, I graduated last year with my Bachelor's in Communication Studies and a minor in Music, and I was also last year's commencement speaker. So it's great to be back here on the stage, and thank you guys so much for having me. Um, aside from a speaker, I'm also a singer-songwriter and have pretty much been doing music my whole life. Um, I've grown up around a musical family. My great-grandpa ran a Slovenian polka band for 25 years, and my other great-grandpa played saxophone for Benny Goodman in the 1930s. And so my dad, you know, growing up, kind of was just around music, so it was bound to be my blood somehow, I guess. Um, I've been recording music professionally since 2020 and have been working on developing my artist project, Myra, uh, for about a year and a half now. Uh, so for that, I record music videos, develop content calendars, and plan marketing strategies, and also write for TV and film. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, but, you know, music isn't as glamorous as it seems, but it's worth it when it's your passion. Uh, today I'm going to be singing my newest release, Pensacola, uh, which I actually just dropped a music video for last Friday. Uh, if you guys want to go watch it later, you can just go to YouTube, type in Myra uh, Pensacola, and it should pop up. Or you can visit my website at myramusic.co. Uh, I will also say I've been sick the past three weeks, so we're going to power through today, but it's going to be great. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to share it with you guys, and here we go. <laughs>
listening to it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. And if you guys want to stay up to date on all the things I'm doing in the future, you can follow me on Instagram at Myra Kiv, M-Y-R-A-K-I-V. And if you guys have any questions too, like feel free to direct message me. Like I'm not a stranger. Like if you have any questions, feel free to message them to me. Oh, it's a sickness. But thank you guys. Time for Myra Kibbett. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. So as you are uh, as you are continuing your voting, uh, my name is Mike Politis, faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies, and just have a brief conversation with Myra here. Myra, can you tell us how did you get started in music? I know I heard in your introduction, you know, you had a fam you know musical family, but how did you personally get started in music? Yeah, so growing up, I played piano. I have three younger sisters, and my mom put us all in piano lessons, and I was the only one that stuck it out. Nice. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got into music initially, and from that, I kind of just gravitated to voice lessons, and uh, from there, I always kind of had just been writing, you know, my own songs growing up. Like, my friends and I, or friends and I, they would come over, and I'd be like, you want to write a song? And so <laughs> we would just write songs, and I always thought it was just something kids did, but then Growing up, I was like, oh, I guess this is just something I do. Yeah. And so I kind of began to, you know, pursue it more professionally after that. Okay, great. So when you write songs, what is it that usually serves as the inspiration for your songs? Oh, that is such a great question. I mean, there are so many avenues of getting an idea for a song. I'd say the biggest one is life circumstances. I'm sure, you know, if like you're having a bad day, that's like a great idea for a song. Or if you're having a great day, that's also a great idea for a song. And I feel like my life can be boring sometimes, so I love pulling from other people's lives. Right. So my sister is a very interesting love life, so I like to pull from her life. <laughs> <laughs> so how does your sister feel about you writing about her love life? Oh, well, I don't tell her it's about her love oh. life. <laughs> this is about someone else. Yeah, okay. this is just about someone. Okay. Yeah. Um, taking, um, connecting your, your singing to your collegiate career, I know you, you majored in communication studies. Um, what made you decide to um, uh, major in communication studies? Yeah, so growing up, I always love giving speeches in class. I used to be really, really, really shy. Like something like this would have been like, oh my gosh, no way. Yeah. Um, but in high school, I joined the speech and debate team and I did broadcasting and a few other forms of public speaking and I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved people. So I'm like, okay, I love speeches. I love people. Communication studies it is. It just right. kind of made sense. And um, I love the program here. It was great. Although I did start during COVID, which was not very fun. Not but I love communicating, and it seemed like the best route. OK. Mm -hmm. I can kind of share that in the regard of do have people who are not very good at math. Anybody like the math is not your strong suit? OK, a number of you, yes. Uh, <laughs> I was also not a math guy and, uh, and uh, kind of fell into communication studies, right? Kind of realizing that a lot of the classes were applicable to what I wanted to do. So, um, so um, and then 
with um, your uh, college career too, so I know you're working on your master's degree now. Last year you were the student commencement speaker. Can you talk to us about, uh, I will just share with the audience as a member of the student, spe uh, the student commencement speaker selection committee, um, and I was watching the video earlier, uh, I'd say <clears throat> of the last 10 years, the student commencement speaker, I think probably at least five of them competed at speech night. Um, so, um, and yes, and so that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that really speaks a lot to the, uh, you know, to the importance of public speaking. So what did you, what can you tell this audience? I know many, many of them not seniors yet, but we'll get there soon. What can you tell them about that process that you went through to be selected as a student commencement speaker? Yeah, I mean, I will say the first thing you think of is when you hear that title is, oh, well, I could never do that. You know what I mean? I think a lot of us, we have this negativity where it's like, oh, well, I'm not good enough to do that. I know that was my first thought when I saw, you know, the application come out and I wasn't going to apply because even though I love public speaking, I'm like, oh, well, I'll never get it, even if I did apply. But my master's advisor, which my program, I did the BA MA program in communication studies. So it's a four plus one, but I was able to get it done a little less than that. But um, my professor, Dr. Head, I had her in my undergraduate classes, which she's great. Love her. Take a class with her if you can. She was like, Myra, you should apply. She's my advisor. So I look up to her and I'm like, fine, I'll apply. And I'm like, oh, I got an interview and I was super excited, but I'm like, I probably still won't get it, which is not the mentality I should have had looking back, you know? Yeah, um, but I'm like, you know what, I'll do it. And I was really passionate about it. I, you know, prepared everything, but still in the back of my head, I was like, oh, you know, I'm sure whoever gets it will be great, you know? And then I got the email that I had gotten it. I was, remember, I lived at the Lux. I was sitting there in the lobby doing my homework and I was just going through it. It was like mid-March. You know, at that point, it had been winter for far too long. Yeah. And I was just having a long weekend. I'm not a crier. Like, I never cry. Like, ever. It's just not me. But I got the email, and I, like, shed a tear in the lobby. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> but it, w it was great. And, I mean, the process of doing it, everyone's so kind. And everyone in this department, which I can't speak to other departments, but I just feel like our department's better because we're people people, I right. feel like. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Absolutely. And so, like, working with you two was just so fun. I, it was so supportive, and everyone's great. Even if you don't get it, you know, it's a great process to grow. So looking back, I'm trying to, to close things up as they finish their voting. Um, looking back on your college career, what do you think is going to be probably a, 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 a highlight for you or two? Ooh, that's a great, great question. I think, obviously, being the commencement speaker was great. I think especially as someone who you know, was so invested into public speaking and speech in high school. That was such a great achievement for me as an individual. Sure. Um, obviously getting my degree as well. My yeah. bachelor's and my master's, like, and my master's, or getting my master's was never really on my mind going into college. I always knew I wanted to, like, do big things, but master's wasn't necessarily one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the opportunity kind of just fell into my lap with the program and, you know, the people that I had around me. So I think that's a huge achievement that, I'll have under my belt, and I don't think I would have done it without the support here. So that Excellent. goes to, you know, everyone here we too. Thank appreciate you. that. So yeah. where are we going to see Myra five years from now? That's a great question. That's well, why I asked. Yeah. Uh, uh, upon graduation, I'm hoping to start my own business and creating like a boutique catalog of mm -hmm. music uh, for TV and film. There's like two routes of the music industry. So you have like the commercial artists that you see, so you know. Michael Jackson, commercial artist. And then there's this other side that's the TV, sync, and film industry. So I'm kind of trying to tap into that industry because that's where you can actually make money. Nice. Um, yeah, right now, artists make pennies. For every one stream, you get 0 .006 cents. So think of how many streams you need to actually make money. Wow. Yeah, my parents are very supportive, but, you know, I also like to, you know, be smart wow. about music. So. Well, we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, if you haven't had a chance, make sure you go and did you give them your social media channels? I did. It's okay. myramusic.co is my website. My Instagram is Myra Kiv. Awesome. Myra, thank you so much. Myra thank Kivett, you. ladies and gentlemen. Okay. All right. And we'll be right with you with the results of tonight's competition. <clears throat> We
we must have quite a home audience because there are hundreds of responses bloating in. So good to see each of you here tonight. And I want to say thank you as they trail off to the side now and having done some hard work. Thank you to Myra and to our guest interviewer, Mike Politis. How many of you know Mike? He is a teaching professor and he is also a stand-up comedian. So we'll put more information on both of them soon on our website for you. By the way, I'm Angela Sisson. And so you're used to hearing from me. I'm the acting director for the IUPUI Speakers Lab. Hello! You have heard that a few times from me this semester, right? Yeah? <laughs> Just a few times. Okay, well, I hope it's been enough to keep your attention with that one. They are back there working on making sure that we get all the votes tallied and all that. We're all very excited for all of the speakers we've had tonight, and we're excited because there are so many people who have really engaged and work really well to make sure that all of this comes together. So I wanted to take just a couple minutes to say some things that I would call housekeeping notes as well as some thank yous. Before I forget the housekeeping notes, please be safe and cautious as you leave tonight. I don't know exactly how dark it is out there yet, but find a buddy if you're walking, okay? And don't forget to keep screenshots of your ballot and the voting for your class either, okay? Make sure that you have those on hand for those class assignments. Now, this competition is exciting on many levels, not just about the scholarship money. It's a great way to share what you've learned and seen people doing in terms of grooming their skills with R110. And as I share with you, thanks to those who make tonight possible, I am reminded of a cliche. How many of you heard this one? It takes a village. Yes. Absolutely. I will say, having worked this end of speech night, and we do call it speech night commonly because that was called that for so many years, and we'll be using that as the official title in the future if you hear it from some of your peers who are taking R110, speech night. As I look at it from this end of, of speech night, I have to tell you, it does take a village. Tonight, and even for each presentation you've seen, it draws upon the help of many, including family and friends. So if you are among the family and friends who've offered support to some of our speakers, pat yourselves on the back and know that we appreciate you. So I want to thank you for joining us, and that would be impossible if it weren't for us enjoying so many, many people. The Department of Communication Studies. We were so grateful to have Dr. Karnak here earlier, and I'm glad you got to hear a little bit from her. I am so grateful, too, that we've had the help from the IU Event and Conference Services folks. Thank you again if you've participated in that. And for those of you who are unaware that they exist, there are lots of events you're attending where you have lots of people behind the scenes who make it all possible to see, hear, and do. I also want to put a shout out to our instructors. Our 110 instructors do a lot in a lot of different ways for our students, and I thank you. Please stand up for just a moment. Oh, come on. In just a moment, the, thank you, the instructors of the speakers will be coming up in a few. And I do want to say thank you to our fabulous IUPUI Speakers Lab mentors, without whom none of this would be possible. They put in countless hours on this. Now, it's that time when we want to leave you with um, our wishes for the best. In part, that involves asking you to think through your semester with us. What did you learn? Did you learn something tonight? Did you learn something throughout the rest of the semester? What's going to stay with you? I want you to take just a moment to, to really think that through. And then I want you to share a thought, if it's a whisper, whether it's a conversation, with somebody near you about what you will take away from your semester, or even just tonight with R110. And if you're just a little bit reluctant to do that with any strangers sitting near you, then of course, take the time to you know, jot it down on your phone. Keep a, a little souvenir of tonight, thinking things through. And a final thought, just a final thought, and then I will turn it over to folks who will soon give you the results of our great competition. Final thought, to paraphrase famed author and educator Stephen Covey Jr., he wrote lots of books ages ago, don't know how many of you know him currently, he had a great, great thought here. Effective communication is built on trust. And trust, trust is based on trustworthiness, not on politics. So in this highly political year, this highly charged year, and a year when you've just come to hear potentially controversial topics, realize that communication comes from the heart 
and making sure that you're always credible with those with whom you communicate. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. I hope it's been a good semester and night for you. And I am turning it over to Katia. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, our lab director, Lorelai Kaplinger, and assistant lab director, Alyssa Taylor, will be presenting the awards. If we could please give one more round of applause as all of our contestants and instructors come to the stage. Okay. All right, one more round of applause, everybody. We had some great speakers today. All right, without further ado, our third place finalist is Molly Bates. Second place goes to Natalie Tysinger. And our 106 IUPUI speech competition winner is Maggie Hopple. Thank you all for supporting our contestants in tonight's event, and thank you to everyone involved in making this event happen. Please don't forget to return your pens at the front and have a safe drive home. Congratulations to all the winners.